Hi everyone, and welcome to the fifth panel in the Film Music Media Symposium 2023 series. Today we've got an amazing panel of composers here to share their secrets on scoring genre-bending shows. We'll hear about their approach to scoring these projects, their process behind it, and much more. Please, so please join me in welcoming our panelists. So we'll introduce them. Uh, first up, he is a composer known for projects like Dead to Me, You're the Worst, and Brockmeyer. Please welcome Adam Blau. Adam, how you doing? Hey, good, Kaya. How you doing? Thanks for having good, me thanks. here. Yeah, thanks for joining. All right, next up, she is a composer at Bleeding Fingers Music and known for her music on The Simpsons prehistoric and, and Prehistoric Planet. Please welcome Kara Talvi. Hey, Kara, how you doing? Hey, Kaya. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you again. All right. Uh, next, he is a composer for Miracle Workers, End Times, and Murderville. Please welcome Matt Novak. Hey, Matt. Hey, Kaya. Nice to meet you, man. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. And last but not least, he is the composer behind Winona Earp, The Lake, and Working Moms. Please welcome Peter Chapman. Peter, how's it going? I'm great. How are you doing? Good, good. All right. So to jump in, I, I love I love asking kind of uh, this kind of general approach question. Um, it's I know it's going to be different based on each project and based on I guess, depending on who you're working with or what kind of the project is, but I'm, I'm curious kind of um, where does the first note come from? What is kind of, what inspires you? Uh, is there a particular process or thing that you do to start a project? Do you like to look at that first cut? Do you listen to something else? Are you inspired by other people's work? Um, do you go for a walk? Do you like to talk to the director and read the script if you're on early enough and not coming in kind of as last second? So I'm curious, just in general, if you kind of, your favorite place to start for inspiration. So uh, Kara, if you want to uh, kick us off. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't really like to go and listen to other soundtracks for inspiration, just because yeah. I'm afraid I'll <laughs> walk away with too much, <laughs> too much inspiration. But <laughs> it really, for me, just kind of starts with a melody. Um, I like mm -hmm. to sit at the piano and kind of find a motif that resonates with me or what I think will resonate with the directors. Um, I also really like to find cool new sounds for the show. So I start with, you know, kind of making a palette. Um, you know, I often brainstorm with maybe another composer I'm working with or our score producer, Russell Emanuel. So yeah, yeah it's a big collaborative process at Bleeding Fingers. And um, that's kind of how I like to get started. Yeah, I mean, it's unique because you're in a, you're in kind of like a nice collective where you have other composers working on different projects. And yeah. a lot of times you're working together with other project, other composers. So that must be awesome to be able to just ping pong yeah ideas. <laughs> exactly it's um a really nice place to be yeah uh adam how about yourself uh yeah i definitely am a, a fan of getting as much information early on as possible so i'll read scripts i'll i'd love to have conversations as much as possible with the producer showrunner director um and really just sort of get my get my ear if i can get their ear uh, to sort of get a sense of what they're looking for out of the music. Um, like Kara, I also like to do a lot of sort of sound design uh, leading up to a project. So I'll mm. often, uh, especially if I have a sense of the kind of sound they're looking for, I'll, uh, if I have the luxury of time, the rare luxury of time, I'll sort of sit down for lengths, long lengths of time and just sort of record myself uh, either uh, playing with synths or, you know, uh, processing different sounds and basically creating a bank of sounds that I can uh, easily pull from um, uh, especially on a fast TV schedule. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, like Kara, also when I'm sitting down to write, I also want to sort of clear my head in the moment, you know, right before I start, I'll listen to podcasts or talk or nothing uh, uh, just to sort of, because again, I don't want to inadvertently uh, uh, take someone else's work and and call it my own. Um, the one exception uh, uh, to all of that though, I would say is if uh, in some of the shows that I'm, I'm working on, I've worked on, uh, if I'm spoofing something particular or really trying to oh, yeah. uh, 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 get a sense of a different style of music that really needs to harken back to what it actually is, I'll definitely immerse myself in listening to that music. I'll watch videos on production techniques for uh, uh, different styles of music and really just try and absorb as much as I can heading into uh, 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 if I'm trying to replicate a particular sound. No, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that. That's, that's, all, that's really, really great. Um, uh, Matt, how about yourself? So, yeah, I completely agree with everything Cara and Adam said. Um, it it kind of depends on the project and the time frame, like how much yeah. time. Um, uh, in a perfect world, I will watch a cut without temp music, just watch it dry 
and like kind of get my own temp going or my own score ideas going in my head yeah before i turn the and then you turn the temp on and the ideas merge <laughs> um i'll find my own like other temps and just you know all these ideas just kind of in a magical world <laughs> perfect world all these ideas will just merge in my head hopefully <laughs> um <laughs> uh and yeah like like adam i do a lot of parodies a lot of spoofing um children's hospitals like all parodies so i'll, yeah, I'll yeah. find those and i'll just like okay what am i knocking off what am i making fun of uh and listen to that um i'll also put together genre playlists so like if i'm working on a particular genre mm -hmm. or a particular medium like i'm working on um uh, uh the new season of harley quinn uh so i have a playlist of just different animated scores because it's nice to kind of study like how those scores work compared to other genres of tv scoring and uh, film scoring but other than that i love to read novels and comic books anything that kind of sparks imagination generally yeah awesome go for walks oh, oh yeah walks absolutely gonna <laughs> yeah, <like> sonic <laughs> cleanser yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh, peter how about yourself so I think uh, kind of going against the grain of what everyone else said, I'm a big uh, fan of like I consume as much music as I can uh, kind of revolt like based on what the project is about, especially shows like, you know, like like Working Moms in the Lake. Both of those are very pop influenced scores. So yeah. I would listen to a lot of pop music based on the kind of stuff that the director's we're referencing. Um, I'm a huge fan. I have like all of these playlists for different genres. And what I often do is I'll go running and as I listen to like various scores or music or whatever, and I, I constantly categorizing things into certain playlists that I'll reference if I need like some inspiration. Um, right. And while I like, I don't jack scores, uh, I definitely will hear stuff and be like, that's cool. That's cool. Like, I want to use that. And I do get really excited about that kind of stuff, especially because you listen to it and you're running by the time I get home or in this studio, I've kind of like, I have a vague recollection of the thing I heard that I liked. And then I find at that point it goes through my own filter and comes yeah. in sounding like me, but I'm like, I love to just consume, consume, consume. And that's something like, if you're lucky enough to be, to work on multiple seasons of a show, um, yeah yeah I'm you can I'm constantly hearing stuff and like getting inspired and inspired and being like oh that would be like a neat element to like incorporate into the score especially like working moms I was constantly trying to keep that score contemporary there's a point when I was like the score the show's like seven years old now where I'm referencing music from seven years ago like so I'm constantly trying to like keep my ear to like cool new sounds that are happening in pop music and incorporate them yeah Absolutely. Well, I want to dive into everyone's projects now. So, uh, Adam, I want to jump over uh, over to you. You you compose the score for all three seasons of of Dead to Me. So, I'm curious what your uh, working relationship was like with Liz Feldman and developing the kind of musical tone for the for the series. Yeah, uh, I love working with Liz. Um, I've had the fortune of working with her several times before. Actually, uh, uh, she was involved with the very first thing I ever wrote music for when I was when I moved to LA a million years ago. Oh, wow. I was a live comedy show, and I had written some songs and and music for it, and that's where we met each other. Um, and I think it's so uh, uh, helpful, at least in this regard, to have that prior relationship because we kind of develop a shorthand after a while of uh, you know just uh, she'll express what she would like like the music to achieve what she wants out of the music. And uh, we don't have to, to go through the whole process of figuring it out and figuring each other's the way we talk about music. Um, that's kind of already established. Um, and I would say for Dead to Me, uh, uh, it, you know, the show itself is a comedy, but it's set against the backdrop of uh, this sort of twisty, turny mystery with cliffhangers. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it develops a very emotional component uh, as well throughout the seasons. Um, and it became clear early on in our discussions uh, as I was uh, starting on the show that Liz really wanted to, it became clear that it, it would benefit the show to avoid any overt comedy music uh, to sort of, you know, despite the fact that it's a comedy, we wanted to kind of play everything as straight as possible to sort of play into the mystery and play into the sort of, you know, some of the sneaky stuff and the emotional components, specifically because the 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 leading actors, you know, Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini are both, their chemistry is just so great playing off one another and they're just so yeah. funny. 
that to to you know to let them do their thing in front of this backdrop of something that was very serious it it definitely heightened the comedy i think for the show if we were trying to play a punchline musically um it was put you know putting the hat on a hat it definitely kind of de it detracted from some of the 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 real realistic comedy against this increasingly absurd backdrop of things that they were dealing with. And, and I think that especially, you know, obviously it depends on the project, but in this case, um, we just found that by, by leaning into the, the, the seriousness, the emotion, that kind of thing, uh, the, the comedy would sort of come to the fore on its own, just through the actual performances. And I wanted to, we wanted to stay out of their way and let them do that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Matt, I, I want to jump over to you because we have to talk about Murderville. So <laughs> how did you, I mean, the show is fantastic. So um, from Will Arnett, like uh, this amazing concept of structured improv, and I'm sure, so I'm curious, um, uh, what was uh, the, the technique, I guess, approach for scoring something like this? I'm sure once it reaches you, there is a, I'm sure they go through so many different takes and different trials to make the scene, you know, kind of put together after all these amazing comedians or actors come in and play around. So I'm curious, when do you start and are you working at a kind of a pretty locked cut? Does it change at all during the process? So I start with a pretty much a locked cut um, and, um, it, and it's tempt, you know, they, they've, it's usually a temp cut as well. Um, Murderville had kind of a, a, a fast schedule so it was just mm. kind of, I had to kind of hit the ground running. Um, but, uh, you know, at, at its core, it's a, uh, a parody of uh, detective shows. So we yeah, yeah. reference, I pull a lot of references from that, and can combine the different things, uh, then came up with an overall sound for the, sc for the score. Um, there's also a little bit of a reality game show vibe in there too. <laughs> so we had to do a parody of that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and the, the tricky part was, was the heavy improv. It, it was like, I've never yeah. scored anything like it or even seen other shows kind of like that heavily structured improv. And it became interesting because if the more over the top the improv came, if the guests or the other actors were breaking and trying not to laugh, right. like, how do you score that? I mean, like, how do you score awkwardness without <laughs> being super like without putting a head on a hat like like adam said um like you can't really do plucky strings uh because i just like it like that stuff like that tends to kind of make things less funny uh in my right, opinion right. Um, do you acknowledge the breaks though like do you or do you, you just play oh yeah. yeah 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 you know, it, was, yeah. it was it was it was usually like you know uh a lot of the score was very structured, like transitions, action set pieces, mm -hmm. uh, finales for the episodes. But it was like the middle scenes were a lot of improv going on, a lot of comedy, but which also like would play really well dry. But we tr it was it it became difficult to actually temp uh, a lot of the temp library temp. It was like too much, like too active or too overproduced. Right. That yeah. is just distracting. Um, and so the, the rule for those scenes, those cues were just like, simple is better. You know, I, I, yeah. one of the first things I wrote was like a very simple bass and perk loop, kind of like a video gamey, uh, like tension loop. Um, I started thinking about the guests like playing a video game, playing a game. Um, and that became like a, I started, I wrote it as a kind of like a catch all temp. Like, okay, we need something here. We don't want to know what you see. Let's just throw this in. Let's at least get the starts and stops right. Um, but half the time, we, that just stayed in. Uh, it was like wow. so yeah. simple and effective, not over the top, just left. It just gave energy to the scene, but not, didn't overtake the scene, just lay, gave space for the comedy. And like, even though it's, it's a simple piece of music, it like, it was a long, kind of a long road to get to that because it, you know, so much, so many other things just didn't work. Um, so it was a lot, it was, an, it, it was an interesting project because of that, because it was like, there wasn't any obvious solutions to some of these things. And just a lot of things are just kind of distracting. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's one of those composer roles, like just do just enough to support the scene. And it's, it just didn't let the scene play because a lot of that just played really well on its own. 
Yeah. Um, I, I can't even think. Sense. I can't even think of like the <laughs> the comparable thing, like SNL or something, where it's a skit on a live audience and they'll break. But it's like, but to have a, like a something that's being filmed, takes after take after take, and build it. Yeah, that's 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 fascinating. Though. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, Kara. Here, I want to jump over uh, to you, uh, you know, as the composer of The Simpsons, can you tell us what your process of working on such an iconic show is like and what was your uh, vision for scoring these uh, new episodes? You know, you're, you, this show has been running for almost as long as probably we've been alive. And so I'm curious. Yeah. Longer you, than I've been alive. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. So you're following this. And you, of course, people think of the Danny Elfman theme and Alf's music yeah. from the past. But so I'm curious how you stepped into it and kind of tried to, you know, bring yourself into it. Yeah, well, obviously there's a huge legacy that, you know, we're trying to uphold with yeah, doing yeah. music for such an iconic show. Um, and luckily we get to work with some of the greatest writers and producers in the business. I mean, yeah, they know exactly what they want and how it's supposed to be. And that makes, you know, our job easier in a sense. Um, I learned a lot about, you know, like Matt was saying, timing of comedy and how sometimes yeah. you're stepping on the joke and they would tell me right in the um, feedback notes, like, no, this isn't funny because you're doing this and it needs to stop at this point so that we can hear his joke. And, you know, so that's something that I got used to. And it's been really, really fun. Um, going back to the parody stuff, which I totally forgot to mention when we were first talking. Yeah, yeah. But that's such a huge part of this show. And, you know, spoofing stuff is kind of one of my favorite things to do because I get to sit there and analyze songs and think about, OK, what is it about this that they like that's making it funny for the scene? But how do I, you know, make it my own at the same time? Last right. season we had or two seasons ago, it was Ice Ice Baby, but it was <laughs> it was like a pizza parlor or something. So they were doing <laughs> Slice Slice Baby. But the. <laughs> But the beat had to be like really identical to the original, you know. Right. So sit there thinking, how did they make that snap sound so cool? <laughs> but, yeah. So it's a lot of that, and um, yeah. And do you start work? Do you start working on it on lock picture or animatic? I'm curious. When do you start? Uh, um, it's your pretty process? much it's pretty much locked when yeah. I start. So it's spots on a Friday, and then there's a few days of writing, and then. You know, we have an internal process with Russell, um, our score right. producer, and then it goes to the clients and they'll send feedback for a few days. And then um, that same or the following Friday, it will score. So it's a week turnaround for every show. Wow. That's that's amazing. That's crazy, but amazing. <laughs> yeah, it um, keeps me on my toes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, uh, Peter, I want to jump over to you. Uh, so the show uh, Winona Herb mixes sci-fi, horror, and comedy. Can you talk about the a bit about your creative freedom on the show and, and kind of tackling these genres? Yeah, I mean, the one of the crazy things with that show was the producers never in the four years that it ran told us to dial anything back. Like it was always like more is more is more is more yeah. so and that as a composer can be really really fun like it got to a point where there is a point I think halfway through the the first season the other composer I was working with Rob Carley we were like have you noticed that they just never they don't really tell us to stop like we just keep going and they don't tell us to stop so I had this idea where I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna write a cue that's gonna make them come back and be like that's too much <laughs> and it was this scene where this guy like gets attacked inside a a van and blood splatters all over the windows. And I just went like full, I just threw everything at it. I mean, it was so obnoxious and loud thinking yeah. like, okay, they're going to hate this. And they came back and they're like, no, this is great. Like keep going. And so by the end, it's just like <laughs> synth, sound design, orchestral stuff. It's it, as a composer, it is so, it was such a fun show to work on, but from yeah. the, the, the comedy perspective of it, it was interesting because like, I didn't score that show any differently than I scored the comedic aspects of any other comedy that I've done, um, you know, like be at work in Moms of the Lake, because it was like, for me scoring, it's it's 100% timing. It's not the palette or the sounds you're using, it's what you're doing and how you sort of shift around the jokes and let them land. And so there was very 
like if you if you if you lined it up the scoring style for the the jokes in Winona Earp, or I set the jokes up exactly the same way I would set them up in a more straight ahead comedy, except that I'm using like, you know, crazy modular synth loops and 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 other weird sound design, um, and like one of the fun things about Earp, like again in the style, it was it it was all in the style that we did it. The fight scenes would be these really really crazy choreographed ninja like fighting punching ripping out eyeballs pulling out tongues kind of stuff but yeah. there would be like constant jokes within these fights so it'd be like fight 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 joke fight 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 joke <laughs> and the way i would score those like i would just mickey mouse the heck out of them but with like this yeah. over the top orchestral percussive synth score so it's really intense but it has the um the char characteristics of like a 1930s cartoon so it's <laughs> yeah. do you know what i mean so it's like intense yeah 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 but it's also kind of winking at you and it lets you know that it's funny but it's also like still has the really like over the top sonic score that 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 we were trying to give the show that is i love that i, I love that you're just literally trying to test them to see what you can get away with it reminds me i went to a when i first moved to la they had this like live script reading of, of Rocco's modern life which i grew up watching on nickelodeon and back then you know when you think of 90s cartoons they got away with a lot more and he would be like we just tried to see if they would we throw it out and like all oh, standards and practices is going to catch this they would like like he works at choky chicken like they're trying to just yeah. see what they can get away <laughs> with and mm -hmm. no, no no notes ever came back they're like all right let's see how much we can push this where today it's like I work in animation and if you miss a seatbelt on a character, they're like, huh, no, go reanimate, retake, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so it's, it's a completely different world. <laughs> Leading up to that show, I had done a couple of more straight ahead dramas and I was constantly told like, dial it back, dial it back, yeah, like yeah. you're overscoring the scene. And I was so used to that. And so when I got on ERP and they were just like, every, play every synth you have at the same time, we want to hear that. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, Adam, I want to, uh, oh no, sorry. I want to, uh, we'll start with Adam, but I want to jump, this is going to be going around the room. Uh, I'm curious if there's, uh, you've worked on such different varying shows. I'm curious if there's any unique instrument or unexpected uh, sound that you found that you had to use that was like just completely out there, but just worked for whatever the project uh, you're working on. So Adam, if you want to kick us off. Sure. Um, in terms of specific instruments, um, I, you know, I, I definitely try to pull from a, a wide variety of things, a wide variety of sources. So it's hard to pinpoint a specific instrument, but I would say that there definitely are are specific uh, uh, sounds or genres that I would yeah, yeah. pull from, given uh, you know whatever the particular moment might be. Um, I'm thinking of uh, a show I wrote music for You're the Worst. Uh, there definitely it it dived a lot into different genres. And so we got to sort of create a like a yacht rock style song from the ground up. We got the right. singer from Ambrosia, like an actual authentic, uh, uh, you know, early 80s band to sing it for us. Or like one episode was a call me by your name spoof for some reason that made it, you know, so it was definitely like start to finish the full episode was you were in that sort of headspace of, you know, all classical piano yeah. throughout the whole thing and just try to sort of dive into those. So it, to pull from unexpected sources um, in terms of just uh, 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 sort of in the spirit of that, I also try to um, leave a little Easter eggs throughout uh, as I'm writing the score, just mostly to entertain myself or the writers, or, you know, the showrunner on a show. So in terms of unexpected things, I'll like, um, I'm thinking of uh, In You're the Worst, there was a scene early on where uh, the characters went into a church and there was a Latin mass playing behind them. And it was early enough in the run that there was no, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have access to library tracks and they didn't want to pay for it. So we knew we needed to create this Latin mass from the ground up. And I knew it was basically going to be me layering myself. And so I went to Google Translate and I uh, basically translated from English to Latin, you're the worst, you love this show, you will watch it all the time to just sort of like, you know, I, I, we got a chuckle out of it on the production side of things, not that anybody would ever actually notice it, but it's just, yeah. I, I don't know, just to sort of keep it fun and uh, uh, to keep ourselves entertained throughout the process, uh, uh, you know, just that, whatever. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know I went to some master class that John Powell did and he broke down his score from oh I think it was the Lorax one of the Dr. Seuss movies and he's like if you actually look at the the chorus and it's literally they're saying it, it was a spoof on the Born theme Born identity and they were just <laughs> what's my name what's my name I don't know I don't know it's just like they're the same like you know and he's like yeah if you isolate those that they're in there that's so, very funny yeah a lot of people do that's awesome yeah <laughs> 
I want to jump over to Kara. Kara, I know you've had a whole experience using unique instruments, and we've talked about it, you know, in the past about prehistoric yes. planet, but Sadly, <laughs> I don't have <laughs> any of them in here because they're in Anjay's studio, but yeah, they're all not there. Yeah, so we, yeah, it's for you. <laughs> what were you? What, yeah, talk about some of that. <laughs> yeah, for prehistoric planet, um, which we scored with Hans and Anjay. Um, yeah, we really wanted to have this otherworldly sound. That was the main note from the producers and they just let us kind of do whatever we wanted. Yeah. So we, yeah. So we built these, um, crazy bone slash dinosaur replica fossil bone instruments and, um, kind of screwed them onto some, um, there's one that's like a baby cello. Um, there's one that's glued onto a frame drum and it has strings on the back. So it's su it resonates super nicely. Um, that's one of my favorites. It's the Fat Rex, we call it. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Hadro Cello. Um, yeah, there's a bunch. I would encourage you to Google them because sadly yeah, I don't absolutely. have them here. Was and there, was there anything like on Simpsons? Appealing. But was there anything on Simpsons that might have like like a unique? You were talking about parodying stuff. Was there anything that just out of this world that you got to use for Simpsons? A unique sound palette or sound that was just like not what you would think for the Simpsons? Is there any kind of like jokey thing that you got to use, or maybe not? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'd call it. Well, last season we had um one of the Treehouse of Horror episodes. They spoofed Stephen King's It. Yeah, so that was a huge like wall to wall score and the simpsons doesn't usually do that it usually right. has a little more breathing room so yeah i think it was basically wall to wall and i got to really dive into those movies and check out what they were doing in the score but then it's taking that score and how do you bring it into springfield right. so you kind of morph the two sounds together and somehow it becomes this really funny um type of storytelling Absolutely. I'm sure Ben appreciated that. <laughs> <with his course. laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, Peter, how about yourself? <laughs> Is there anything unique uh, instrument that you got to use? Um, I mean, I've used a lot of weird stuff. The thing that I'm the most excited about these days was um, on the lake. Uh, it, Like I said, it's a very pop music score and they do a lot of right. sort of references to the different generations of characters so there's sort of the the 40 plus year olds and then there's the 20 something uh year olds and we support that with the score and so one of the things i got to do a lot was write these very authentically 90s cues that sound like full-on max martin britney spears kind of uh kind of vibe which is really really fun but if you don't have the right equipment to do it it's really really hard so I actually went and bought a bunch of these like old, I can actually show you, like this is my little rack of like 90s gear. Oh, here. nice. Oh, cool. And, <laughs> and I would use those. And I've also, I've got this like great old like emulator too from the late 80s that I've loaded with samples. And awesome. using those would make like, I would make these hilarious Britney Spears Backstreet Boys kind of cues and we'd hire a vocalist and uh this vocalist and I were actually thinking about possibly making a record because we realized we're really good at making like late pop 90s pop music. Pop yeah. music. <laughs> so we might actually do it. But yeah, there's something, man, like you, when you go through the patches on these things, it is like, like you've heard every one of those sounds a thousand right. times. And it's just like instant nostalgia, at least for me. I That's like my era. I grew up in that stuff. So uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah. That's that the stuff that I'm really excited about right now. But see, I think that's, I, I love that that you have to go searching for that gear that today's gear can't bring you, like you need that sound from the gear they have to go searching for that even with today's technology and samples and all these different patches and things that you could do today. It's like, no, the best thing to do is to go back and find the, the gear that did that. Mm -hmm. The same thing if you go back to the 80s and then 70s and stuff like that. The thing about these is it's not even like, because like a lot of stuff you could get like emulators of like a Korg right. MS-10 or whatever, but these are like actual weird samples of like people shouting and singing and like, <laughs> like weird synth patches that sound awful, but like you can only get them out of these boxes. I mean, some of these you can get <laughs> do exist virtually and people sampled them and I have some of those as well, but there's just right. something so satisfying about like pulling up these sounds and being like, oh, that's the sound. That's from that song and that song. I'm going to use it in this because it's going to be a hilarious yeah. Easter egg, you know, so. 
That's awesome. <laughs> well, and the uh, Matt, visceral experience of, of playing it on those actual synths too, just yeah. as, you know, as they were originally played, I imagine. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, um, he, he, uh, uh, score, he, yeah, he did, it was like a seventies throwback score or something. He had to go back and he was calling people on Craigslist and just trying to find all this old gear. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that's the only way to get that sound is just go to garages and dig through people's stuff. <laughs> but Mm -hmm. uh, but Matt, I want to jump over to you. Uh, anything that you, cool or unique that you got to use? Well, uh, I, you know, like Adam and Carl was saying, like a lot of parodies. You know, I always like kind of find, you know, emulate the sounds of those those instruments that we're parroting, or um, you know, they're like jokes in Harley Quinn and uh, Children's Hospital and, uh, that like require specific instruments. Um, yeah, yeah, like I. Uh, for Two Face, I had I wrote a uh, jazzy theme for him. It was, that was a lot of fun. Um, probably the most un unique ensemble I used uh, in something. Uh, but I don't know if this counts. Uh, for Miracle Workers and Times, uh, part of the score is like ju junkyard instruments. Oh, um, that's awesome. And uh, um, when I was starting the score, we were doing some cleanup in our backyard and dug up a an old super old rusty set of keys I'm like oh great you're part of the score and so that like <laughs> became like my shaker or my yeah bow triangle you probably can't hear it in the score at all <laughs> but uh it makes pretty low uh a lot of reverb on it um but yeah i i don't know if that counts but that <laughs> yeah that, that totally counts that's a, super a awesome no, I, yeah no, I've heard so many stories of just turning in just to household products or stuff or just things around the house you can turn anything into a musical instrument i think that's the, the beauty of yeah. it so yeah, yeah. absolutely um so i want to uh, i want to go back to adam adam for the show you're the worst uh some of the episodes feature different themes and from different genres like horror and adventure um, how did you integrate these themes into the score for an alleged already genre kind of bent rom-com yeah so um so the show itself is it's ostensibly a romantic comedy but it's uh it's about these misanthropes these like totally misanthropes you know these people who don't like anyone and they do not want to fall in love and of course they all fall backwards into love and kicking and screaming um and so the, the the sound of the show itself is uh you know it's sort of pop music based uh a little turned on its ear you know a lot of sort of synths and grooves and guitar um, but throughout the run of the show, there were these sort of increasingly absurd, absurd moments and, and as you say, theme episodes, uh, throughout the run. So every season there was, a uh, a, a Sunday fun day episode where each, it was sort of the, the gang of characters goes off on these crazy adventures, uh, you know, either a citywide midnight madness scavenger hunt or, a, a sort of an extreme horror haunted house Halloween episode, or, you know, and it, it kind of runs yeah. the gamut. There's, a, a definitely, you know, a, a uh, uh, serial killer and you know the, you know so it really runs the gamut and um the the show's creator Stephen Falk was really encouraging not just to me but to all of the departments to really dive fully into whenever we had those those episodes so we had a little advance notice you know I'd get a call from Stephen and he'd say hey we're going to be doing a you know the the call me by your name episode or the right. the the Eurovision episode where you're going to have to write a bunch of Eurovision songs and so uh you know we we really uh, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, became friendly with the other departments to sort of correspond and sort of get the vibe of what the makeup department was doing and the costume department was doing. Um, uh, I had the good luck to sort of uh, be in a few of the episodes as well. Steven sort of cast me when there were various musicians playing throughout the seasons. And so I got to sort of be on set and see how they were manifesting some of these things in real time in person. And uh, we, we he definitely was very encouraging to sort of say, go all in as much as you can. And it was exciting because we in the middle of working on this show, it's suddenly like you're working on a totally different show. Um, yeah. The, we really got um, some perspective shifts too throughout the the course of the show. Maybe we'd start at the whole episode would start with totally different characters. You don't know who anyone is, and you're you're in another show. And of course, it starts wending its way back to our main characters and the original sound. And so, it was definitely fun figuring out in the moment how to sort of uh, uh, navigate that. How to 
still feel a little bit like you're watching the same show maybe but then then uh get the sound back to our regular sound and we we turn that on its ear a little bit too uh, uh at various times uh i'm thinking of a uh there were two episodes back to back one was sort of a regular episode where you sort of saw the action with the characters start to finish and then the following episode um, was th- all of the same events of that first one, but from the perspective of another character who was suffering from PTSD. And it was a deathly serious episode, and it really just sort of took some of the more comedic moments and figuring out how to change all of the various elements to see it from this other perspective um, and incorporate some of the same themes, but setting it differently to to sort of see how this other person was sort of, of dealing with it. And so it was, uh, I absolutely loved working on that show. There were so many different aspects to it musically. Um, there were songs, there was score and uh, so many different styles of each that it was just a thrill. And having those conversations with Steven uh, and the various other writers about how best to achieve that uh, in each unique circumstances was a ton of fun to work on. I mean, that's, I mean, and also just, I think just the shift, the changing, like changing pace all that time must just keeping you, you're creatively rewarding, just kind of changing and keeping pace with all of that. <laughs> Absolutely. And thankfully, most of the time on that show, we, there was enough advance notice to be able to actually pull it off. There were a few times where it was suddenly, you know, you'd have to, you know, quick change, gear, you know, switch gears on a, on a moment's yeah. notice, but to be able to, as we were saying before, kind of dive in, do the research and, and just sort of have that relationship with the various other departments to, to get a sense, you know, either the art direction and uh, whatever it might be to really get the visuals ahead of time and 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 prepare for it and know what you're going to be doing was, was fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Kara, I want to uh, jump back to you. You know, you got to work on The Simpsons and Prehistoric Planet. Those are two, technically, I guess, Prehistoric Planet could also be, say, as an animated show. You know, had Jean Favreau involved with the CGI yeah. of the dinosaurs and everything. So I'm curious how those two maybe different approach working on this, like, kind of n- nature documentary CGI animated, you know, uh, you know, in the in the vein of you know the the, the BBC Earth stuff that we were, we all love and know for you know David Attenborough's narration and and all that versus Simpsons, which is you know kind of traditional two D animation television kind of sitcom style. So I'm curious if there's any difference in approach that you could talk about at all. <laughs> I'm sure they're very different shows, but I'm curious about your approach. They, they definitely are very different shows, but. I've thought about this a lot and really the approach is the same for me where I'm watching the picture and it's all about storytelling and you're playing something in and you're watching and seeing how you react to it. I mean, emotionally, that's my process. But what I will say is that they're different in the way that in these BBC nature shows, um, the sequences are much longer. So you have like five to 10 minutes. So you have this big story arc for this sequence. And for The Simpsons, oftentimes you have like five to 10 seconds. So for me, that's more challenging because it's how do I, how do I say what I want to say in this short amount of time and spell out this emotion in such a quick moment? Whereas with Prehistoric Planet, you have way more time to get to that climactic emotional moment. Yeah, absolutely. And there's the fact that The Simpsons is a linear TV show with commercial breaks with, you know, acts. Is that, does that help you? Is that a different structure than doing something on Apple Apple TV, which is just, you know, it just runs for, I mean, you talked about their segments and they have those arcs and there's kind of a yeah. pause and we move on to the next segment. Is that similar, I guess, in structure to doing, act, you know, act in, act out for, a, you know, commercial breaks and stuff like that? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's the same in that you're kind of you know, you have an an initial idea maybe in the beginning of the episode and then everything right. comes full circle at the end. But it's all just about time, yeah. I think, you know, for The yeah. Simpsons, yeah. there are many little, sometimes it's just stings, but, you know, right. they still have to hold a certain feeling and tell the viewer what's happening here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Peter, I want to jump over to you. Some of the musical cues on Working Moms blend a few genres of music. Uh, what was the inspiration behind these? And what was it like working with vocalist Maylee Todd? So, yeah, so that was a neat show. Um, season one and two, we were we were really struggling to find our, to kind of like find the sound of, of the show. The The producers both, were they both have really great tastes in music. Um, and they had a lot of opinions about music and they wanted to like 
they wanted their own tastes to reflect back into the score, but they also wanted, um, you know, they wanted it to be fun and 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 kind of sexy, but they also wanted like a very strong feminine presence in the cues as well. And that was where mm -hmm. Maylee Todd came in. And um, what the way we ended up scoring that show was, it was really fun. I ended up building this crazy Maylee Todd library, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these different instruments um, of her doing all of these different kinds of like shouts and screams and yells and grunts and like acapella sounds. And then I also built all of these sort of like Maylee Todd Mellotrons, which are like her singing different vowels and things that I could then, that I could then play. Um, just because Maylee is very, she's, she had went to LA a few years ago. So we don't, we aren't even in the same city anymore. And she's got like a whole career that's just blowing up. So she wasn't always uh, there to sort of put in the same hours that I was. However, that being said, she was always like a phone call away. So there would be certain cues where I might demo something up, send it to her, and then she would sing on top of it and turn it into something really beautiful. Um, wow. But yeah, and now, and every year we would add more and more content to the library. A lot of it was, we had sort of a rule where it was like, don't say no to anything, like any idea you have, we're just going to record okay. it and, and make a library out of it. Uh, I would say 10% of that library uh, will definitely never, ever, ever, ever uh, see the light of day. It was <laughs> just like ridiculous and offensive and screaming and very funny. Uh, but but I think like the bread and butter stuff was definitely the more Mellotron based things. Um, There's a lot of sort of vocal, like tonal vocalizations that we made and she also built a lot of loops that i would kind of chop up and use and stuff so you do hear yeah. a lot of her of her vocals in the cues um but that was su that's such a fun show to work on i'm really sad that it's ending yeah it always it sucks when projects come to an end and like <laughs> especially it's something that, yeah all that work all the time and everything and then you just look back on it but then you have it there i mean it's great to you know something to look back that you guys all worked on together with the whole show team and everything so mm -hmm. absolutely <laughs> um so as we uh, kind of wrap up our conversation, I, I kind of want to go around and and just, you know, love to know what everyone is working on, you know, um, what we can expect to hear. So, um, Matt, I know you just scored the new season of uh, Miracle Workles titled End Times. Without giving away too much, uh, what can we, what can you tell us about the score that we can expect to hear? <laughs> right. Well, hopefully it comes out soon. Um, uh, I'll try not to spoil. Uh, there is a trailer out, so I, I, that at least gives me some wiggle room. Um, the new season, every season, it's an anthology. Um, this season, it's like a Mad Max-esque post-apocalyptic story. Uh, mm -hmm. So the score is, you know, like Peter was saying earlier about we guys talking about uh, older 80s and 70s since um, they're going for like a an 80s VHS vibe uh, for the whole show. So they're referencing, referencing Mad Max and yeah. Escape from LA and Terminator. Uh, so we referenced a lot of those scores, but I actually, actually lean more on references by, by Giorgio Moroder, John Carpenter. Um, we also like tried to um, use some of those like older synths, like uh, the Korg Triton and the Juno. Um, uh, those, those are kind of like older, kind of sorely sort of cheesy-ish since, uh, but still very era appropriate. And uh, when we built since, we tried to make it mono uh, and distorted, uh, so they sounded older. Mm -hmm. um, and then also blended in with that is uh, junkyard instruments, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Steve right. Buscemi plays a, a uh, I probably that's a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> probably, I don't know. No, no character know. reveals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, actually, it might be in the trailer. I don't know. I they could probably safe than sorry, better uh, safe than sorry. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a junkyard plays a part in the world. Uh, so I started thinking like, oh, well, these people would probably put together an orchestra of janky junkyard instruments. Um, that ended up just being mostly percussion, and there, there was a lot of samples for that and uh yeah that's when you can expect to hear hopefully hopefully soon 
Well, please do. <laughs> well, let's let's jump over to uh, Kara. Kara, I know you just got renewed for recently two more seasons of Simpsons. So congratulations to the whole Simpsons team for that uh, oh, yes. renewal. Thank you. So other than Simpsons, or anything we can look forward to that you can talk about? I know maybe something is under NDA. We don't want to you know do any <laughs> violate any NDAs. Well, but... <laughs> this has been announced, so I'm pretty sure I can say. <laughs> um, Far Away Downs is Baz Luhrmann's new series that oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so um we had the privilege of working with him and it's a really cool show and it's coming out on hulu in the near future i don't nice. know when. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome adam how about yourself anything that you're working on that you can talk about uh yeah well uh at the moment i'm excited about uh an animated short that i had written music for it's a half hour short um that is at the moment as we're recording this it's one of the nominees for best animated short for the oscars uh, i don't know if oh, i wow. can say the title because i know we're trying to keep it family friendly and it has a bad word in it uh, <laughs> a bad word uh, 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 bleep, so you bleep it look, out bleep yourself okay, out <laughs> it's my year of bleeps um uh and uh it's a it's a film uh by pamela ribbon uh the writer uh she's a, a, a has done a lot of disney stuff the, the opposite of this uh, <laughs> uh she wrote moana and uh ralph breaks the internet and this uh the this animated film directed by uh sarah gunner's daughter an icelandic animator um, it's a sort of a coming of age story about a 15 year old in Texas in the nineties. And, um, you basically, it fits in actually very well to some of the stuff we've been talking about today, because it definitely has this sort of bass sound of nineties, uh, uh, pop, but the sort of fun part of the film is that she goes off on these sort of flights of fancy. You enter her imagination at various points and they're all very genre specific. So there's a whole yeah. segment where you are suddenly in a French film from the 60s or you're in a horror movie or you're in a, an anime. And so the music and the animation style follow suit. Um, so it was a ton of fun to work on. We are all very uh, uh, ecstatic that people are getting the opportunity to see it now. And uh, uh, it definitely was just a, a, a lot of fun to sort of dive into each of those different genres, uh, very similar to uh, uh, stylistically to some of the other projects that, that uh, I got to work on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's move over to uh, Peter. How about yourself? Um, I wrapped literally just last week, had playbacks for the final the series finale of work and moms um oh, wow. and that's actually airing in canada right now on cbc and it'll be on netflix probably by the spring or summer uh and that the the, the last season is it's great it's very it it's very weird they get completely insane in this one it's like they didn't have anything to lose so they just went for it yeah, um, right. But I will also say the finale was very close. It was very personal to Catherine Reitman, the uh, the show's creator, and is uh, there. Were, there was a lot of tears in the final playback. It was very. It was, it's a really beautiful episode. Um, and then I also just finished the finale, uh, the season finale for the Lake, uh, which should be on Amazon, I think by the summertime, uh, and that was a. Uh, really great project spearheaded by uh julian Doucette. and uh yeah i'm excited for that to to go up online as well that's awesome absolutely so uh, for before we uh, our last thing that i want uh, i want to do before we want to go around the room with everybody again and i know a lot of young composers uh, who are thinking about entering entering this industry or or just getting their foot you know in the door getting started so i'm curious if you had just one a one sentence two sentence piece of advice that you could give somebody i know everyone's journey is so different and unique and the industry we're in is constantly shifting under our feet especially now but if there's one piece of advice you give to someone who's just starting their journey i'm curious uh if there's anything you would give so uh kara if you want to kick us off Mm, I would say it's very important to write music every day yeah. and um, really take the time to find your own personal voice because it's such a competitive industry and it's important that you stand out. Absolutely. Well said. Adam, how about you? Um, I guess I would say to uh, just keep working on projects of all different sizes and styles and stripes um, uh, at any level. If it's music that uh, uh, 
if it's a project that is of interest to you, then by all means, go for it. Um, everything I've mentioned today, everything, every project that I've worked on today that I talked about were with people that I had worked with previously on other projects, whether it was a live comedy show or a YouTube video or whatever it might be. And being able to establish those relationships and work with people is just invaluable. So, uh, uh, you know, there's there's no project too small if you believe in it and believe in the music itself. Absolutely. Peter, how about you? Um, you know, for me starting out, uh, it was a little, um, it was surprisingly, it wasn't like directors or, or whoever that gave me my big break. It was other composers. And I've found that, you know, becoming friends with other composers early on in your career and not just like network, but like genuinely just like be friends with people, like yeah. make a bunch of friends in the industry, make friends with other composers, let people know you're hungry, you know, like, like let people know, like you're, you're here for it and you're ready to like, you want to do this and you'll do it, do anything to get it. Um, I, I don't know. For me, that was my attitude when I started and it was, it was composers that were too busy that taking on projects that like, they had to pass on stuff and they started kind of throwing me little slabs of meat. And that was, uh, that was how I, how I got all of my early breaks. So that's the advice wow. I would give anyone starting. Yeah. And the, 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 the composing community is just amazing. I mean, just being part of it, I'll, you know, going to all the SEL and the events and just everyone and, you know, being there and supporting each other, but yeah, that's not well said. Absolutely. Uh, Matt, how about you? How do you want to finish this off with uh, your piece of advice? Yeah, I, um, well, if you're just getting started, like you just yeah. got to LA or whatever, uh, I started off as a composer assistant um, for a composer named Steven Stern. Um, and also I worked for Craig Wedron and stuff. And yeah. I went to USC and I, I learned a lot at the, the film scoring program there. Um, but I definitely learned more working for other composers, getting real world, real world experience with them. And like Peter just mentioned, um, you know, Craig gave me my breakout show uh, with uh, Children's Hospital uh, for Adult Swim. Um, mm. So it's like, yeah, you know, the and I I, I co-score things with Craig from time to time. I still do. You know, I try to help out other people. I like to help out my friends uh, if I'm not too busy. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, start. Uh, work, you know, meet other composers, work for other composers. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my, that's the advice I always give, you know, just, yeah. you know, yeah. It, it's, because yeah, school school is such a bubble. Like for me, I, I went to film school. So you're just like, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I'm going to do all this cool stuff. And then you get out in the world, you're like, oh crap. Like, <laughs> you know, where do you start? Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a shock. We, when you get in the real world, like, okay, what do I, what do I do now? Uh, but yeah, I, I recommend being an assistant or, uh, you know, mentor, mentee. Uh, yeah. Cause you get to just see them work, you learn, you absorb, and then you figure out your way of doing it. You know, you don't, don't, exactly. also, I would say, yeah, don't copy them, but just to figure out, I guess, yeah, your way. <laughs> exactly. Like I picked and choose, I learned and then like, okay, that works for me. That doesn't really work for me. It was nice. Craig was, uh, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm rambling. I, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Craig is a very good pop composer of that kind yeah. of style. I'm more of an orchestral guy. So we kind of, I was able to kind of learn something from him. You know, it's like a style that I don't, didn't really grow up doing or really, right. but I was able to learn from him, uh, learn something different that I probably wouldn't have learned on my, maybe eventually, but it kind of exposed me to a different kind, uh, different approach to scoring. Absolutely. Very well said. Well, everybody, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight, for being here together. It was, it was just absolute fascinating to to hear all of your processes and then just, you know, talk about all your approaches and everything and hear from all your projects. So, I mean, Matt, Kara, Adam, Peter, thank you so much for all of your insight. And I want to thank our friends at Impact24 for helping uh, co-produce this with Film Music Media to put this amazing panel. We have the entire series going. So go to filmmusicmedia.com to check out the other panels that we're doing. And uh Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you so much. Yeah.